Are you ready to get wrecked? Because the Rechtenwald returns to geopolitics and empire. Michael Rechtenwald is former NYU professor and author of 11 books, including Google Archipelago, The Digital Gulag, and The Simulation of Freedom. You best get this book and read it because judging by events in Canada, the Hunger Games have officially commenced and we are now in the thick of the Google Archipelago where you can have your bank account frozen for donating money to truckers. Michael, how are you doing and how are you enjoying the Google Archipelago? I'm I'm hanging in there very well. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to our talk. Yeah, I think you were ill for a while, no, and you recovered. Oh yes, I had COVID and uh, went in twice to the hospital. The first time uh, for, was for COVID itself, but then it really I left the hospital, uh, and then the medications they gave me made me sicker than anything. Uh, I was given some. Uh, anticoagulants that ended up causing me to have intestinal bleeding, which almost killed me. So the second time I went into the hospital, I was under, uh, I was under respiratory failure. I couldn't breathe at all. Uh, and uh, so they had to put me on a ventilator. I was completely unconscious. Uh, they put me on a ventilator. <laughs> Everybody that knew me thought this is a 50-50 chance to survive once you're on the ventilator. Uh, I was on that for like three days, but I, I didn't know that. I, I woke up and, you know, I was in the ICU and uh, just said, well, how long have I been here? And they said three days. I was like, what? I had lost them completely. So uh, I was in 12 a days in the ICU and a couple more days in the regular hospital bed. And oh boy, I couldn't walk when I got out. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I was so weak. I lost 50 pounds. Yeah, it was I, intense. I, I, I was shocked when I saw you posting that on Facebook and Twitter and your social media. I was like, I, I couldn't believe it, but glad that you uh, recovered. And, um, you know, in our, in our previous interview, I think it was eight, nine months ago, uh, which people should go back and watch. It's, you, you sort of laid the foundation for the Great Reset. Google Marxism, as you call it, this one world monopoly of government or global socialism. Today will be maybe a bit more of a, like a graduate level course where we dig deeper into more of the technical aspects such as the environmental social and Go government governance index esg which is a chinese style social credit score for rating corporations your latest piece on mises.org details this uh, incredibly there are still many people who have no idea what esg means they, they gave me blank uh, faces and even still some who don't understand the social credit system so maybe we can start with uh, with the esg yeah, so the ESG, the Environmental, Social, and Governance Index, is an index on the stock exchanges, of course. And it is a means by which corporations are rated along these criteria. Uh, so environmental, of course, has to do with their carbon footprint and their sustainability practices. Social really comes down to social justice precepts. How well are they abiding by social justice precepts in terms of how many, you know, what's the constitution identity wise of their board members, of their management, uh, of their staff and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's kind of like the diversity, equity and inclusion element. And then governance really refers to uh, how do they, what's their corporate governance like, but also how well do they in, interact with the state? How well do they abide by state law and policy? And uh, so what it's doing is, you know, I've been, I've been reading some people, even a Marxist. I just read a Marxist who, who argues that, uh, that wokeness, in effect, is a means for differentiating between the, the elite and the others. Uh, it's a... It's a selection me mechanism. Similarly, the SG, which is wokeness in capitalism, this is woke capitalism, it is a mechanism by which you differentiate between woke corporations and non-woke. It's a way, of, it's a selection mechanism. It's a, a demarcation device in order to separate out the non-compliant from the compliant. And then it, it effectively feeds investments toward the compliant and away from the non-compliant. So as I see it, it's a way of starving off competition, starving off industries and starving off players within industries 
who are non-abiding, who are not who are not compliant uh, with the with the uh, agenda. Uh, so it's uh, in in my way of thinking, it establishes kind of a woke cartel or a set of woke cartels. I mean, if you look at the uh, major investment asset uh, managers, all of them are totally down with this. Uh, all ten of the top ten. Uh, especially BlackRock and uh, Vanguard and State Street and UBS. And they're all completely, they're completely down with this. I mean, Larry, Larry Fink of, the, uh, of BlackRock is, uh, puts out these letters every year. He put one out on January 18th. And it's basically, he throws down the stakeholder or the ESG gauntlet. If you do not abide by these precepts, you will be starved out of capital. You, you will not survive. Competitors will come and replace you. He puts it exactly like that. You'll be replaced. So it's a kind of cancellation. Just as in the, the social realm, individuals are canceled. They're canceling corporations in the same way. And interestingly, they're differentially diverting funds to China, Chinese companies. So it's a really unbelievable development. And, uh, you know, I was reading uh, the UN, uh, uh, there's a ton of UN programs that are all about this. Uh, there's a, uh, the principles of, uh, uh, principles of banking, principles of uh, asset management and principles of insurance. And they have uh, 4,700 investment firms banks and asset managers signed on to this, 4,700. And the World Economic Forum is a major player in pushing it. Uh, you know, I think, and I've been looking into this for a while, I think, I think that Klaus Schwab is actually the inventor of this idea of stakeholder capitalism, which is to benefit stakeholders as opposed to or in, in addition to shareholders. And stakeholder capitalism is the premise for the ESG. It's, it's the guiding principle for the ESG, of, which is the mechanism for enforcing stakeholder capitalism. It goes back to 1971 and uh, uh, Schwab's first book, uh, which title sort of eludes me, but it was published in 71 year he founded the precursor to the World Economic Forum. And, uh, you know, He's been pushing this stakeholder. He and the WEF have been pushing this stakeholder idea for decades. So now it's completely in, in, embedded in and infiltrated uh, all corporate America and corporations broadly across the world, all, you know, the entire banking industry. So, you know, this is the premise that sets up the possibility for doing to companies what is being done to individuals in Canada right now. Uh, debanking them, uh, defunding them, freezing their assets. This is all part of uh, the same campaign. It is wokeness writ large. And wokeness is not some sort of a funny, you know, silly ideology that's just for, you know, making fights on Twitter. This, this is really a major demarcation device in order to separate the wheat from the chaff the wheat being them, in their case, that's how they think of it. The chaff being everybody who is not on board. Uh, so, yeah. A message from our sponsors. The Nomos app will help you survive COVID-1984 and the Great Reset. Nomos is a time bank that can be used by communities anywhere in the world. You just need to talk people into using it. For example, if you go to your barber for a 30-minute haircut, your barber receives 30 minutes in his time bank. He can then use that time to pay for an appointment with the doctor. I've spoken to the developer who is passionate about creating solutions for surviving and thriving in the apocalypse. Nomos is available in both English and Spanish. Hurry and visit nomos.net before they roll out the cashless society and put you in the algorithm ghetto. Also, if you need health insurance that covers you wherever you may roam, check out my friend James Guzman's Borderless Health Insurance. One of the great things about living internationally is saving money on health care, but private care overseas can be expensive. 
Go to borderlesshealthinsurance.com to watch a short presentation on expat and digital nomad healthcare and sign up for a free consultation to review your options. Geopolitics and Empire needs funding. You can leave a donation, book a consultation, or become a member, which gets you access to my brief weekly commentary, a monthly newsletter of my thoughts, a private telegram, a monthly members group call, and my second premium broadcast called Dissident Thinker, where I conduct interviews and provide solo analysis. Dissident Thinker is also available on Rockfin and for supporters on Locals. The timing is interesting. You mentioned where I've seen that as well, um, where uh, Schraub kind of came up with this in the 70, 71. And the the timing is interesting because some people say that, you know, our economic system, the Bretton Woods system from 1944 died because that's when Nixon took the, you know, uh, pulled gold uh, away from the dollar. And so some people say that that's when the Bretton Woods system died. And so it's like funny how he comes in at that moment. It's like they were preparing the, the next economic system, which we're now seeing go uh, live. And what you just detailed sounds like classic totalitarianism. You know, we've seen like when we in the communist systems, they've created, you know, the the, the with the cultural revolutions, the, the 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 communist class, the elite class, and then all of the, the rest who, who don't comply are like the dissidents sent off to the gulags or in the Nazi system. You know, the, the Jews, yeah. Jews and, and gypsies and others were, uh, you know, uh, dealt sent to ghettos. And it's just kind of like what you just detailed is, you uh, it's you're creating this two class society now that it's totalitarian in nature. Yes. I mean, this is, um, it is totalitarianism, but there's a few steps that you have to get to, to understand why it is totalitarian. And one of them is to realize that first of all, they're cre- the, this, uh, stakeholder capitalism, which is Schwab's brainchild, as far as I can tell, uh, that his first book was the first place to introduce this idea that stakeholders, have to be um, served as well as stockholders. But it goes to the point that the governance uh, of you know, states are basically uh, corporate uh, entities in conjunction with states in order to enforce these precepts and to enforce this particular I- ideal an ideology, this political through and through. And it's a way of this, you know, destroying opposition. It's a way of destroying opposition. So this is why it's totalitarian. It's it's using a political mechanism in order to inf- invade the economy, uh, completely infiltrate the economy and make the economy utterly politicized. Uh, and uh, that's you know that's exactly what's happening in Canada right now. They're the, the, unbelievably they're seizing bank accounts, not seizing but freezing bank accounts in order to uh, in order to uh, silence and destroy these uh, protesters. So this is a sign of things to come. And uh, for those in the United States who think this wouldn't happen here, if we had the same scenario going on here, which uh, supposedly in the near future, we may, with the truckers ready to go from, um, I think, Los Angeles to D.C., then it would happen here as well. This is no question in my mind. These people are the same, birds of the same feather. Both of them said that they admire dictatorships, and dictatorships would be so much easier to run. And, of course, you know how much they admire China's dictatorship. So, so Trudeau said that, Biden said it, they both they all say this. They're on the same playbook. It's unbelievable how much they're on this playbook. And this is why I say it's internationalist because they've got all these all these players signed on to the same precepts, signed on to the same play, playbook. And uh, in you know basically there's regional elements of a global system. Really, that's what's going on. Yeah, I, I just had a brief commentary on what you brought up, you know, for for years, people like ourselves have been discussing all of this. You know, I, I was looking back through my archives way back in 2015. I was talking to Catherine Albrecht on this coming dystopia in 2019. I spoke with technocracy expert Patrick Wood precisely about the social credit system in 2020. I spoke with Jewish historian Edwin Black on the algorithm ghetto in 2021 with, with yourself. And, you know, we've been waiting for the moment to arrive at some future point. And I think it's it's not like you just kind of mentioned it's, it's it's coming we see it now in canada i think it's here and it's and it's global like it's starting to 
happen in it's it's happening in China, it's happening in other countries. Um, as you mentioned in Canada, I think today Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi suspended uh, over half a million Italians uh, over the age of 50 from their jobs, leaving them without salaries and declaring the unvaccinated are not part of society, which for, for me is also kind of like the ESG because they're not complying with the you know social uh, decrees uh, of the state. And so therefore they're kind of like, th th their job is turned off, their financial support is turned off. Uh, funny, this weekend I was talking to a low level Mexican government functionary who was telling me to my face, you know, yes, if the experts say vaccine passports, aka social credit system are necessary, then I believe them and screw the people who, do, who don't want to submit, let them be unable to work or buy food or, or travel. And also today, um, famed economist Richard Werner was tweeting that the ECB is getting ready to kill thousands of banks in the Eurozone in the coming five years. So I feel like, wow, it's, it's starting now, like it's no longer, it's just started in Canada, it's starting in the US and in other countries. And it's like it's it's live now. I mean, it's live. Saying? I mean, it's been in play in terms of setting it up uh, for some time. You know, I wrote about that in Google Archipelago. Um, this is, I think, now this could, you know, maybe rub the wrong way with some viewers, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think it's a leftist authoritarianism, a leftist totalitarianism. Um, now that doesn't mean all of the left is on board with it. I've been reading some works from these so-called red-pilled Marxists who um, I, I find the uh, frog Marxian, Marxian element of the Twitterverse to be quite interesting. They're saying similar things that we are. Um, they see what we're talking about. They see the totalitarianism and they know it's coming from uh, the left generally. And they're resisting it because these people don't want what happened in the Soviet. They, they call this the Soviet Union uh, in America, basically, where we are now in the United States. And that's a pretty apt characterization. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I just I had a, someone reach out wanting to be on the podcast um, who's written a few books, a young young person who's a hardcore Marxist. But he's a Marxist against, you know, this COVID uh, dictatorial regime. So uh, I'll see if he'll come on. But it's it's interesting uh, what you said. And I, I wanted to go back kind of we may have talked about this before, but I think it's important. The structure of this yeah. global government, you 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 know, yeah. you said that Klaus calls it. And I saw him recently come out and say it's a public private partnership. So partnership. in one way, it's like the worst of both worlds, you know, monopoly capitalism the worst parts right. of extreme capitalism where it's a uh, total private monopoly power and communism where it's state, you know, m monopoly put together. And, you know, we get something like a biofascist technocracy. Uh, my recent guest, who's also a leftist, Keys van der Pale, described how long ago the UN had been, you know, co-opted by these special interests, um, as well as the national governments, including China and Russia, like are, are all on board. Uh, I mean, right. what are your, what are your latest thoughts on, the mechanisms of this global yes, government it, structure. It's a corporate state hybrid, which is completely unaccountable to constituents in national governments. There's no voting on any of this. They're, they're the public private partnership motif, if you will, in order to establish this. So you have corporations effectively involved in governance. Of course, none of these people were elected. So this is completely undemocratic. And uh, they're infiltrating all the states if they're not already completely embedded in them. And they're dictating policy through state apparatuses. So they're effectively part of the state. So, yes, it's the worst of this is exactly what Giorgio Agamben said. This is the worst of both systems. It's communist capitalism, if you will. That's state run cap communism with capitalist corporations. Uh, embedded in the state. Uh, this is the worst scenario you can imagine. It takes the worst of both worlds. And let's face it, I've never said anything is perfect. And certainly pure capitalism wouldn't be perfect. But it's what I aspire to. And I think what we should aspire to because it's the only state of, of freedom. But this is, there's, it took the worst elements of capitalism, that is this tendency towards monopoly and combined it with the worst elements of communism, state communism, which is state dictatorship over the economy and everything else, and put them into one. And this is what we've got. Uh, it's, that's 
it's why so hard for people to get a handle on what's happening. Yeah. You can't categorize it very easily. And I've been working on this for months, if not years at this point, in characterizing it and giving it a name. Uh, it's economic fascism, strictly speaking. It's what I call corporate socialism. That's corporate oligarchies in conjunction with the state on top and actually existing socialism for everybody else, inclusive of the repressive and oppressive and uh, uh, discriminatory and, uh, 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 you know, um, jackboot elements of socialism uh, on the ground, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I would correct uh, some of my, respectfully correct some of our uh, leftist listeners um, with their view of, let's say, capitalism and, and conserv conservatism, they kind of paint, paint it automatically as this right-wing fascism. And my idea right. of myself as a conservative and believer in basic capitalism is that we are, in general, conservatives are, are against concentration of power of any kind, whether it's financial right. or, or political. Um, right. And so we're skeptical that, you know, power corrupts. Absolutely. And so we're not in favor of, you know, financial capital concentrating, you know, this private capital concentrating, nor for the state, whereas leftists have this great faith in the state, and they're okay with having this power, you know, concentrated in, in public institutions, which is a huge danger. And now we're seeing this run roughshod. And right. some, some of them are doubling down, you know, like we've seen some of the extreme leftists are doubling down, you know, like there's people like uh, CJ Hopkins, who's a more reasonable leftist, I think, has been calling out other leftists such as Ben Norton, who was um, writing for a gray zone with Max Blumenthal. And Max, Max Blumenthal kind of woke up to the COVID-1984 and started talking about it. And Ben Norton like had to leave because he's still totally pro big pharma. And it's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's also like, it's also confusing. Well, it's very messed up. But here's, here's the one, right? I understand why leftists are, uh, have less of a problem with corporate monopolies than we think they would, because uh, it has something very much in common with socialism. And that is to say, what is socialism if not a monopoly? Uh, so it's a state monopoly over everything. And so they actually end up favoring monopolies, monopolies over other things. I mean, Jacobin, I think we talked about this before, ran an article about uh, the, how small business was overrated and, you know, really big corporations treat us much better. You know, they give us benefits and uh, they allow unionization and so forth. So we shouldn't be fighting for small business rights and, and so forth. So really, they actually tip their hats to the corporate monopolies. And so they, they have less problem with corporate monopolies. Also, they don't understand that the state enables all this. If it weren't for the state, there wouldn't be this kind of concentration of power because that's, that's, their, that's their enablers. That's how monopolies get established, through, the, through state power, in particular, I don't agree with Marx that monopolization is an inevitable part of capitalism. It's really inevitable when, when the state is involved, which they are. Um, and they have become the state now at this point. Uh, that's what's happened. I, I wanted to go back uh, for a second to what we were talking about, the ESGs. And maybe if you could just go a step further and detail viscerally more like what this would look like, um, you know, for, for a company to be run out by ESG or even individuals, you know, I guess we may have seen some examples now of Mike Lindell, the pillow guy. So banks yeah. are now unbanking him uh, and just, you know, the businesses in general uh, opposing mandates being uh, shut down here in Mexico now in some parts of Mexico in the town where I city where I live, um, businesses who are not complying with the uh, vaccine certificates you know, government agents like, you know, the Stasi are going out and somehow, I mean, it's illegal, but somehow the government's just, uh, they call it clausurado, just shutting down the business. They, they shut it down. They put a big sign that says shut down uh, and you can't do your, do your business. And, you know, people like me, I've been kicked off of Patreon. Others uh, like Ryan Christian of Last American Vagabond has been taken off of PayPal. I mean, how do you vision this like actually well, it, looking like? It, it, yeah, with the ESG. So we already see cancellation of companies based on political uh, 
affiliation like my pillow or uh in the case of uh big tech firms of course uh various firms being canceling and canceled themselves for that matter uh but this is different the esg is different in that it institutionalizes this mechan this mechanism it's not just going out and targeting people in some sort of haphazard fashion finding somebody says something wrong and debanking them and so forth it is uh, an institutionalized mechanism for destroying companies. Uh, so through the ESG, what happens is you just have investments flowing away from these companies. Uh, and, and Fink has made this very clear. I mean, he said, basically, he said, uh, uh, here, here, let me just give you a quote. He says, at, at the foundation of capitalism is the process of constant re reinvention how companies must continually evolve as, they, as the world around them changes or the risk of being replaced by new competitors, end quote. So the corporations that are to be replaced uh, are those that don't abide by the ESG score. And this is, you know, very, very much on the table. And this is, very, it's happening. It's well underway. Do you think it would still be possible if there was a company, maybe a smaller company, not a big corporation that was running its business well, didn't have a lot of debt, had a lot of cash savings, that they would be able to withstand, uh, you know, the ESG? Yes, I think some companies will be able to withstand it. But what they're doing is loading them up with a tremendous amount of bureaucratic red tape and reporting, which is extremely difficult. Now, the one way they, these companies like that could could survive is by uh, other people becoming aware of them and then investing in them frankly uh in fact there are e there are non or anti esg uh indexes out there or funds already in established uh one of them is maga uh but there are others uh, one is called bad because they invest in alcohol and uh gambling uh, and they're not woke at all. And uh, there's others out there as well. There are these funds that you can invest in that are explicitly anti-woke. Uh, and so one way to, uh, you know, I'm not, this is not an investment show and I'm certainly not an advisor. <laughs> uh, so I don't mean to do that. And I know that you know, investments in companies is a very, shall we say, privileged position to be in in the first place. but if you do have any money in the stock market by chance, by virtue of a 401k or whatever, uh, try to get it out of there and get it away from the ESG abiding and ESG reporting companies and managers, certainly. But this is almost impossible for many state employees because BlackRock manages the, por the investment portfolios of numerous states, uh, their pension funds and all this. He's got enormous pension funds under his belt. I mean, this only, by the way, BlackRock only started in 1997. And in that short time, they have taken over and become the number one asset manager in the world, controlling $10 trillion worth of assets. Um, before, so before we started the interview, you mentioned uh, Ron Unz. So I recently interviewed Ron Unz, and that interview got a bit of play. Um, no Agenda, uh, the Adam Curry, John C. Dvorak podcast uh, actually played like 20 minutes of it, and they were uh, discussing it. Um, and so, you know, Ron Unz has this idea that COVID was a bio warfare attack from the West uh, against the East. I think he laid out a great history of where we it's clear that we see, you know, like Robert Kennedy has laid it out as well. The CIA is involved. It's a DARPA CIA intelligence operation. They've yeah. been simulating the pandemics for 20 years, uh, but it just I don't quite go on board with Unz's idea that because we're seeing China tacitly go go on um go along as well and we've seen china's involvement with it as well with their cooperation with in, in the Wuhan and receiving funding from uh, Fauci, uh, you know, EcoHealth Alliance and all, all of this stuff. Um, so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on some of the, the, these topics? Yeah, well, let me premise it by saying that Ron Unz is a great guy and uh, the Unz site is just fabulous for the diversity of opinion that he allows and uh, the, the writing is very, very good, mostly. Uh, 
And one thing that bugs me about certain sites like Rock, Lou Rockwell's dot uh, com, I love the right, I love the ar- arguments, but some of the writing is just dreadful. Um, but the only problem I have with Unz is uh, ca- cla- his characterization of the origin story and the way it developed is that it doesn't take into account the unanimity of responses by states across the world to the pandemic, so-called. It doesn't take into account the fact that there's obviously a coordinated campaign uh, to impose these mandates and sanctions and uh, you know the mass mandates, but also the, the travel mandates, the vaccine passport mandates, the, uh, the green pass in, in, the, uh, in, in Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. So it just is too coordinated to be just an accident like that in the sense that, I mean, it's possible indeed that the virus did start from a lab in the United States uh, under the direction of the uh, person who was responsible for bioweapons development in the United States, and then it went to China. But why then did all of these countries act in the same way? Uh, how is it possible? So there, I think you have to look at the way this has been coordinated. And I think the WEF is actually a pretty big player here because they actually trained a lot of these leaders in the Young World Leaders uh, uh, Forum or whatever they call it, uh, this Young World Leaders Group where they have brought all these people over there and basically trained them up on these principles of uh, stakeholder capitalism and uh, really, you know, state corporate fascism. Uh, And then the responses by all these states to the same issue have almost been identical, although staggered somewhat. And uh, there is some difference uh, in application, but it's in principle, it's all the same. So, uh, you know, it's possible that that's how the thing originated, but it's not, it doesn't account for the total picture at all. Yeah, I, he I sort of said, well, they all sort of imitated each other. I, I don't think so. I think there's too much coordination. It would be quick imitation. You know, this was really uh, lockstep, really. Yeah, I, I would totally uh, agree with you. And a lot of people are seeing that you, you can't, that's an anomaly that you can't uh, dismiss and what we see Russia and China are going hard, hard. Uh, China just announced they're not doing away with their zero COVID policy where everything is locked down. Uh, I just spoke uh, to someone uh, to, who I know who speaks Mandarin, who's, who's in touch with China. And like it was pointing out how in Xi'an, they locked down the city of 13 million. Uh, and then people in China are starting to now, the, the youth in China are starting to kind of get um, irritated and talking about rising up where in Xi'an, when they locked people down, there was a guy having a heart attack. And they wouldn't like let him leave the lockdown area. But he couldn't go to the hospital because it was a COVID hospital. So, I mean, they just like let him die from a heart attack. Um, and I've, I've been talking to Riley Wagaman, who's in Russia. Uh, he's going to he, he's going to be contributing to geopolitics and empire um, articles. But he's been demonstrating how Russia is full on implementing vaccine passports, QR codes like crazy. And so you mentioned the, the young what do you call them? The young WEF young leader. global leaders. Yeah. And so we've had people like shockingly like, you know, even Viktor Orban of Hungary and Putin were leaders. And I think it's important yeah. to point out that just because someone has attended a meeting or been the leader doesn't necessarily mean they are with it. You know, I, yeah. I've, I, I've been, I attended a globalist institution, uh, my university, alma mater, but I'm not, you know, a globalist. Yeah. And we've seen yeah. JFK came out of the aristocracy, but then he turned. Uh, and right. so, yeah, that's true. I, I, this is a genetic, I don't mean to afford a genetic fallacy here. I taught in a global liberal studies program that was training people to be NGO worker, NGO managers. In effect, that's really what it came down to. And you know, we know what the role of NGOs are. Um, so, yeah, that's that's true. That it doesn't mean much that necessarily, but it just so happens that all the major lockdowners are. Let's put it this way: not all the people that attended the young global leaders are part of this, but all the people that our part of it did attend the Young Global Leaders Forum. So oh. Macron and Trudeau and uh, what's her name? The uh, Jacinda, New Zealand. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, yeah. 
Yes, Arden, uh, all these people were involved. They were all brought over there and trained up, and Gates as well. Um, you know, yeah. it's interesting how Gates, when he talks about vaccines and what we need, he keeps putting a, we need, we, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Like he's implicitly part of the ruling establishment and he's doing the ruling. I mean, where did he get off? He's not elected to anything. And yet he acts like he's in charge. But uh, Yeah. And also, but also, I mean, given what we just said, Putin was a leader and he is not stopping what's being done in Russia. So true. he's implementing it. And even Viktor Orban, who's good on some issues, anti-globalist, he's also right. low level tacitly not stopping going along with some of these COVID-1984 measures. So again, that's the actions are, are telling you uh, a lot. I mean, if I were in power, I would be a JFK. I'd be willing to die, you know, tr- trying to stop this system. And it was recently reported that Belarus now, Lukashenko, who has long been one of the few holding out, uh, so I think in Belarus now they're they're introducing the QR code um, system. Maybe t- to get back on the on the social level, I had a question. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that this Mexican government functionary who I t- spoke with loves the Great Reset. Um, in an epoch <laughs> in an epoch Times interview, you said there is this laptop class or, or people who work in the government who basically earnestly, earnestly believe the Great Reset propaganda. Um, they agree with it. They support it. Uh, I've been I've seen people sitting in parks or cafes or restaurants and gatherings gleefully discussing, you know, which biologicals, as they call them here in Mexico, vaccines or injections they're going to take next, you know, their third, their fourth, their fifth. And in one sense, they have actually now become our enemies because they have declared us uh, as enemies. They're cheering for us to be thrown in the algorithm ghetto, like, you know, the Germans cheering on the Jews uh, um, being thrown into the physical ghettos. And so I'm still in disbelief. The number that has been done on these people, you know, the, our neighbors, friends, yeah. co-workers and families, how do you treat or deal now with this laptop class? Because it's getting more dangerous now because yeah, there's there like this guy telling me to my face, oh, I don't care about the people who don't comply. Well, you understand for me, that means I, I can't travel. I, I won't be able to work. I can't feed my kids and they don't care. <laughs> yeah. Well, when, when, the, when the so-called pandemic began, I said to my son, I said, you know, what, what scares me about this is not this virus or COVID-19. What scares me about this is the state and what they're going to do. And this was before they started doing it. And he's like, what? They're going to be our savior. I said, ha, hardly. And so well, the way I look at these people is they're dangerous. They're state agents. Uh, they have been enlisted into the state. They're actually state functionaries, if you will. So I find them to be very dangerous and to be avoided and to be feared, to be treated very cautiously. None of these people can be trusted. Uh, These people will turn you over in a heartbeat. These are like the Nazi uh, foot soldiers, in effect, uh, and the population that went along with all this in Nazi Germany. They're the same types of people or the people in the Soviet Union that uh, that that uh, spied on and uh, reported their neighbors for making some sort of a deviation, for being deviationists of some sort. So, yeah, I find these people to be dangerous. I think they're state agents. I don't trust them at all. Everybody out there that is not, uh, well, how should I say, who is not on, who doesn't see through and see COVID-1984 for what it is, is a very dangerous person. I, I would agree. And I've started to think about this, even, you know, some of our friends who have bought into the narrative and yet haven't got, you know, gotten, you know, stopped talking to us or anything where we still get along. We're still able to get along. Um, they haven't shunned us. I, what you just said, I still fear that at some point, if the government continues, makes these measures and they put like crazy new laws where if you don't, you know, inject your kid or if adults aren't injected, then they will be fined. Um, they should be reported. I'm afraid yeah. that some of my neighbors or even some of our current, you know, fair weather friends would turn on us. As you said, that's like a <laughs> that's a danger. Um, yeah, absolutely. How do we resist and fight back at this point? <laughs> well, what we have to keep doing this and keep doing what we're doing. I have said this before. What we're doing right now is resistance. It is part of the solution. Um, but furthermore, um, I think it's going to come to mass action, frankly, at some point. 
like it like it has in Canada, and I think this is going to spread. And there has to be a massive pushback against these state uh, mandates, these state dictatorial policies, this whole coordinated state fascist uh, overlord situation. Uh, and you know, defiance has got to be the key. And there's a couple ways to defy. One is to become a walled ganger, that is to effect effectively eject this from yourself. Don't let it be part of you and to uh, have a, a sort of inner rebellion first. You have to have an inner rebellion in order to be able to withstand the pressure and have an external, uh, an external rebellion as well. Um. Also, I, I'm a bit of a fan of game theory. Uh, and so it's like I, I'm also the kind of person that I just like to prepare things in, in advance for everything yeah. in life. You know, just I like to have things done in advance in, ca in case something happens. I've already yeah. got that issue solved as, mu as much as I can instead of, you know, waiting for something to break and then you're kind of screwed. And so yeah. I'm just that kind of person. And so people tell me to be more optimistic and and have some have more hopium uh i'm not a defeatist by, by any means you know otherwise i would have been already long gone in the woods or the mexican jungle but as we uh, both discussed uh, last time i i think that things are going to get still extremely dark and you know that's my kind of sober assessment in terms yeah. of in terms of contingency plans uh, in the meanwhile you know what's constantly on my mind is how to best survive this social credit or beast system and you know i think of things like and other people on the podca podcast have brought these things up like limiting use of smartphones degoogling your phone using cash as much as possible getting funds yeah. out of uh, the banks as we're seeing now in canada i, I think there right. were some rumors on social media of bank runs in canada uh putting your wealth into you know into physical stores of wealth local banks alternative stores of wealth creating local networks uh, where you you were talking about the anti-esg yeah, funds and parallel kind of, structures in effect. yeah you're getting a farm if you can you know one good news uh, I, I read recently that nick vujicic the serbian australian christian evangelist born with no limbs he's creating the pro-life bank uh which is going to be have one physical location in texas but it's going to be an international bank that i think everyone will be able to use uh without being deplatformed um have you thought about how to live day-to-day -day life um uh, if this social credit system <laughs> advances yeah, I mean, I've been trying to live like it's already here uh, by virtue of being uncancelable. And that I think m most importantly is to get independent from institutions that are part of the system. I mean, this is not possible for many people who are working uh, as salaried employees of these organizations, uh, whether corporate or state. Uh, but I think the entrepreneurial independence is key to get away from these institutions who are really going to crack down uh, on everybody uh, and I've cracked down on so many already. So that's, that's the primary thing. I think trying to have uh, viability outside of the system. So that I think speaks to parallel structures, uh, parallel communications, parallel media, parallel money, parallel uh, production, parallel exchange, and so forth. So we, we are way behind the, the, uh, the eight ball here in what we should have done by now in establishing these parallel structures. Uh, we should have these networks much more established. Uh, networks of people that are willing to exchange for, with each other that are uh, producing and, and selling things. Uh, you know, For example, the frontline doctors are beginning to set up uh, I think a hospital, and and uh, so all the defectors from the COVID nineteen eighty four regime in the medical field should have been and are in effect beginning to establish parallel medical institutions because it's going it's come to the point where we could not we might not get medical attention if you haven't been vaccinated, and these people will not do that to you. So those kind of things, uh, you know, I do what I can on a daily basis, but, you know, I'm pretty busy with uh, writing and uh, trying to get uh, my message and ideas out there uh, in order to try to um, forestall and avert and defeat 
uh, this move, this, this, this development, this totalitarianism, this global totalitarianism that we're under. And I still see people that don't get it. I mean, I'm so surprised that people don't get it. They go, why are they doing that to the Canadians? I'm like, isn't that's not very smart or that's not what do you realize what we're dealing with here? Don't you see what we're and once you understand that we're dealing with totalitarianism, everything makes sense. But they don't they haven't read about this. They don't know any history. They just don't get it. So, uh, yeah, they're still thinking that we're living in some democratic society. You know, they're still living in the probably have a nostalgia for probably a past that never existed, really. And they're still trying to live off of ether, you know, memories and uh, beliefs that don't apply. Now, that's that's one thing I would say is you have to expel these false beliefs because they're 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 deadly. This is the thing that's getting me like I still can't believe how people don't get it. And I was telling this guy this again, this this guy who was telling me he loves the Great Reset and um, he loves the Great Reset. I mean, that, that's my words. I mean, he was just yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. if you don't play along, I don't care. Screw you. But um, I'm just losing my train of thought. But I, I was posting uh, on Facebook. We saw recently France like um, they had these uh, convoys in, in France and Paris and the cops just smashing windows uh, of people and gassing, you know, restaurants where families are. Are, are enjoying uh, meals in Canada. We see the shock troops coming in and in tanks. And I'm like, I post like, are you going to double look at this? Like, are you going to double down on your Stockholm syndrome or are you going <laughs> to finally wake up? Because yeah. I mean, it's like, hello, let's right in your face. Like, um, yeah, even people that are on effect uh, putatively outside of the, that, you know, that aren't branch COVIDians still don't get what we're dealing with. And as long as they don't get that, they're going to continue to have the wrong responses. And that's very dangerous for them. It's but, dangerous for us, too. Because they're the useful idiots pushing all of this uh, along. And you just go to your previous thought on parallel economies. It is getting tough. Well, there's a lot of people, as you say, who are salaried employees. Um, yeah. I think one thing that holds them back is me is mental, where they're just afraid to leave that job, that that, that corporate job that they've been working in. And right. I think they could succeed if they just, you know, had more courage uh, and yes, took, took risks. That they, they could be successful. Yeah, they could be successful. But on the other hand, like the university where I used to work here in Mexico, I just discovered. I mean, I knew they were a globalist institution. They've had Hillary Clinton and Bill Gates speak at the graduation <laughs> ceremonies yeah. and right. Al Gore. But uh, someone just showed me officially how the the school where I used to work, Tech de Monterrey, is owned by this corporate conglomerate called FEMSA which is officially connected to the World Economic Forum. So wow. it's just, it's incredible. Like, it, as, like the work you've been doing, if you dig deep enough, you will find all of these things. Um, is there any other issue that I, I haven't brought up that, that you wanted to comment on? Well, I think on? that that's very interesting what you said about courage. It took, I got to say, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but it took courage to leave NYU, uh, a globalist institution of the first order, in uh, fact, you know, I worked and taught in a global liberal studies program that was basically training people to be globalist leaders uh, and middle managers and upper managers and stuff like that. I mean, they gave a, a deanship to to Chelsea Clinton and paid her six hundred thousand dollars a year for doing nothing. That was kind of like one of the tipping points that started driving me crazy about what was going on there. It takes it takes great courage and i think people need to buck up and find that courage within uh it, it's you know you know maybe some reading will help i think it helps to read how people in for example uh under communism in czechoslovakia and other regions survived totalitarian communism because we're under it uh, I, I don't know if it's it's not necessarily communism per se we're dealing with as i said communist capitalism or corporate socialism but it's we're under totalitarianism and so you need to find out how people survived those things and one way to do it is to re re look at the past now they're not going to be the same not all the you know certain situations are you know have distinctions that can't be reproduced uh, but um, nevertheless there's many parallels that you can draw and they give you resources and inner sustain inner sustenance in order to 
uh, resist and survive. All right. Yeah. And any then last word, final thought for us? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to find out what I'm thinking in general is go to my website, michaelrettenwall.com, uh, where all my essays are. Uh, you can find all my books connected there. Uh, my media appearances like this one will be up on the media or interview page, uh, things like that. And, uh, there I talk about what, um, what, what I think is going on and what, what is, what to do about it. I, I am not like the solution man, so to speak. I kind of am an analyst of what's happening. Uh, so I do look to others too, in terms of what to do. And I think there are some movements out there that are interesting to look at, like the greater reset, the freedom cell movement and so on and so forth. So keep your eye on those. Yeah, I'm also a bit uh, more of an uh, observer of the state of things and dabbling more in solutions. But I think uh, I think we're all going to, by force, by necessity, need to start looking more <laughs> at, at, uh, at solutions. So yeah. Solutions, yeah. And again, I have your website uh, bookmarked michaelrecknewall.com. I follow you on Twitter. Uh, so again, people should follow you wherever you are uh, online. And it's it's always great to chat with the Recknewald. And uh, good to see <laughs> that you got you got your health back. Uh, and Thank you. again. Uh, th thanks for being back on Geopolitics and Empire. My, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit and Twitter take down posts. And after the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.